Now I feel good. Yeah. After I sleep a lot and play golf a little, and you, you, you know, under those circumstances, you ought to look good. <laughs> And oftentimes in the industry, uh, the word legend is used very loosely, kind of like the word hero is used. And I, I could really only describe one individual in the industry that can truly be described as a legend. And that man is standing beside me right now. He is uh, the innovator of the modern airline construct. Bob Crandall, welcome to Load Factor. Thank you. Nice to be here. I remember, was it in the late 60s you were with TWA, is that correct? Uh, in, yes, in the, well, in the 60s, yes, the late 60s. I was with TWA for about four or five years, yes. And then you left TWA, and you did something really interesting. You went to Bloomingdale's, of all places. I went to Bloomingdale's as the, the TWA chose the wrong guy as president, and I said, that isn't going to work, and so I went to Bloomingdale's. Well, you know, I, I always wanted to ask you this, um, because way back then, you went to a retailer. Retailers are really in touch with the brand and merchandising. Airlines haven't always been associated with, with great merchandising. Just recently, that's what this conference is all about, loyalty and merchandising, ancillary revenue, um, value-based ancillary revenue, not just fees. I wanted to ask you, what, what lessons did you bring back from your stint with a retailer, <laughs> Bloomingdale's, for, for, for merchandising? I didn't bring any lessons back from, uh, from uh, retailing, other than the fact that retailing compared to the airline business is extremely boring. And the consequence is I uh, thought... I thought then and I think now that running something, the operational side of running a business, and of course the airlines are very operational, very complex, right. was just a lot more interesting than deciding whether the men's socks were going to be on the second floor or the third floor. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, talking about your time at TWA, uh, you, you know, I, I just wrote a blog in the Load Factor called Merger with a Smile. Of course, American Airlines is going to be merging with your series. Very exciting time. Uh, and, you know, over, over the years, uh, during your tenure, um, you, you saw some mergers yourself. And, you know, in so certain circles, you'll talk to, to folks that have been acquired by an airline. For instance, folks from TWA that are with American. And, and they often make the distinction that, oh, I'm, I'm from TWA, even though they're with American. You know, uh, how do you make sense of when, when air, it's like the Borg, you know, from Star Trek, the Borg uh, assimilates. And sometimes airlines assimilate one another. And, but then you have many cultures, a melting pot of cultures in there. How does this affect customer service in the end result? And, and where does this come from? Where do you think it's going? Well, of course, one of the great challenges that <clears throat> every, every merger incorporates is, is the importance of getting everybody on the same page. So airlines, of course, have, have long distinguished histories. So somebody that was with TWA for 25 years is proud of TWA, and they want to sort of preserve that. But a successful merger means that everybody comes together to promote the company that everybody now works for, whatever that company may be. And everybody gets dedicated to providing very good customer service and running the, doing the operational side of the airline so that whatever airline it is ends up with good customer service, on-time airplanes, clean airplanes. That's what the business is about. So the task of management is to bring everybody together around the common goal of making the resulting airline the best in the world. You've said in the past, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll paraphrase, that the, uh, the co-chair system is inherently deceptive to the customer. Um, I would agree with that. Uh, me being an old interline guy, uh, what's your opinion on, on the interline system? Is, is pro-rate broken? And should we encourage airlines to, to kind of reinvent themselves from an interline perspective versus co-chair? Well, of course, code share, code share is going to work as long as it is permitted because it, it effectively deceives the public. The public believes that it's staying online when, of course, it is not staying online. It's simply taking an interline journey. So there isn't any reason for prorate to be broken. It was negotiated. Prorates were negotiated over, the, over many years and could be today. But as long as governments permit airlines to misrepresent themselves by using code sharing, then it's going to happen because it works. It persuades the public that it's an online journey and the public believes an online journey is superior to an interline journey. My guess is that it's going to be very difficult for a startup carrier. As you know, there's very little business traffic in the Caribbean. 
They're all leisure fares. The consequence is load factors have to be very high. And for a startup to compete with, with a mainline U.S. carrier is a very intensive, capital-intensive business. So I would guess that it, it will be very difficult for any startup airline to succeed in the Caribbean. And then very last question. We are at a loyalty conference. You know, loyalty folks are buzzing all about the place here and <laughs> frequent flyer geeks and that sort of thing. Uh, it really is great fun. Um, when, when you inspired Advantage program, I guess guys like Tom Plaskett and Hal Brierley were around. And um, from what I hear, you were banging on the desk and yelling. So we got to do something for these business travelers. They're, they're, they're really pissed off because of this deregulation. And um, so originally, when you inspired the Frequent Flyer Program Advantage, it, it was towards the business travelers, that high yield um, uh, customer. Today, it, it's kind of this ubiquitous program. It's, it's touching everyone. We're selling lots of miles. We're earning all this ancillary revenue. Um, what's your opinion on, on that shift, if you agree with that shift? Well, remember, remember you, you need to keep in mind that the role of Advantage, the Frequent Flyer Program, was never the business traveler. The focus was on promoting repetitive use of the airline. That is to attract not only, not 50% of a particular traveler's business, but 100% of a given traveler's business. And when we invented the program, which people forget, the, uh, the original design structure was that you could only accumulate miles for a year, which meant that you wanted to travel every time on the same airline. Right. Now that got perverted very quickly because as people matched what American did, they said, well, we'll improve it. We'll let miles accumulate forever, which they didn't understand this, but what they had just done was subvert the fundamental, plan, fundamental objective, which was to get every traveler every time on the same airline. Now, of course, everybody belongs to all the plans, and the consequence is that People who fly very frequently can accumulate lots of miles. The objective, the underlying objective, however, continues to be to get that infrequent traveler, as well as the frequent traveler, on the host airline as often as possible. That was the objective. It has turned into a multifaceted program, including a very satisfactory distribution mechanism. Right. But that was the original goal. And are, are you pleased with what it's turned into? One can hardly be not pleased with something that's been as successful as frequent flyer miles. <laughs> wow, wow. And you heard it from uh, Bob Cranell himself, the man that inspired this whole revolution, that why all these folks are here. And he's here, very assuming, um, uh, favorite son of Rhode Island. Uh, Bob Crandall, thank you for joining us. There's only a few of us. We have to stick together. <laughs>